Um, so, welcome. This is a talk about Mill. Uh, my name is Guillaume Galli. I'm a software engineer at Faber Novel. Uh, we do have a booth in uh, the old way just outside if you want to learn more about our company, what we do, and all that. Don't say taste. Come talk, with, talk to us. Um, you have my contact details here if you have questions, but I can't answer at the end because you don't have enough time. Don't say taste. You can also come to see me in the old way, whatever. I will answer all of your questions if I can. Um, so, the agenda for this talk, pretty simple. First of all, uh, I'll do um, world, uh, really a whirlwind tour of meal, just the basics. Why is it interesting? Why I think you might be interested in it? Um, just a small hint, yes, it's a build tool um, for Scala mainly, and also Java because that helps for Scala. Uh, it was created by the OAE. You may um, know about him for from a bunch of other open source projects in the Scala community, uh, things like the Harmony Shrapel or Scala tags, and so on. Um, the real meat of my talk will be uh, a demo. Um, hopefully, we can go from zero to publishing a library to Maven Central, but, but if we're like really quick and efficient, so we'll see. So, first of all, okay, new build tool for Scala. There are a bunch of those at this moment. Why? Um, so we have to answer this question, what's wrong with us, BT? <laughs> um, first of all, okay, let's not spend time um, complaining about the weird syntax of the SBT DSL because that's really a surface issue. It's something that can be fixed. It's, it's something that has already improved really a lot. And um, the current uh, maintainers of SBT are, I think, doing a really good job with what they have for that sort of issue. Um, but there are some underlying issues in SBT in like um, the, um, the main architecture of the project. And that's why a lot of people have been uh, uh, trying to create new build tools for Scala at this moment. Um, the first thing that's kind of weird is, okay, you have a setting key somewhere in your build, like uh, which Scala version to use, which options to pass to the Scala compiler, things like that. How do you resolve it? How do you find what value is used where? And this is basically a four-dimensional grid, which is kind of hard to wrap your hand around. Um, because there is a key itself, it has a name, which sits in a global namespace, but okay. But then it can be scoped based on which task to use this, based on a configuration. Um, you may have sometimes have to play with using the test configuration and the compile configuration for your test code and your regular code, for instance. And of course, based on project scope, because uh, you can have several uh, projects in a single build, of course. Um, another thing is that the execution model for uh, SBT uh, is multi-layered, and by that I really mean like there are three layers. There's the build that you define. You write a build.sbt file, okay? And then that gets executed to create a new model, an intermediate model, which is the real model for your build, actually. And this model is uh, mutable. And then there is the actual execution of whatever you're trying to execute with SBT. Um, this is kind of hard to understand and hard to debug. Where do you put some print lines or whatever, or debug points? And um, it's also really hard to navigate in an ID. Quick question, who here has already tried in your build.sbt, uh, in your favorite ID, whatever it is, to navigate to the definition of a key. Okay, quite a few people. Where do you find, what do you find when you do that? You find something called like a task key of unit or um, setting key of string, something like that. You don't find the actual definition of what the task will do. Um, it's somewhere else. And the actual resolution of the real implementation of each task uh, gets done at runtime when SBT runs and uh, creates a second layer, basically, from the previous point. Um, and the last point that I added in is also, in SBT you don't uh, get caching by default for your task, like the result of a task is not cached by default. So if you need to have some cache in your, um, in your task to not reevaluate it every time, uh, that needs to be in implemented each time. There are ways to do it, of course, but it could be a bit neater. So, where do we go from there? Well, for uh, Mill, uh, we have a few basic ideas. The first one, to create a build tool, we need a way to define, um, to define a build. 
Um, so a build, at its heart, is this. It's a directed acyclic graph. It's directed because we want to obtain something at the end. Uh, in this really simple example, it's a so release jars. Um, and it's acyclic because if you have a cycle in your build, it's basically an infinite loop that can be a bit annoying. So in this example, okay, we have this graph. Uh, how do we actually express this graph? Well, really simple way, at least I think for me and I think for a lot of you, we can just write a purely functional program for this. Uh, like, or uh, there is a step called compile, okay. That can just be a pure function. It takes in some sources, it outputs some uh, compiled bytecode. If you give it the same sources, it should output always the same bytecode, I hope. There's no reason why it would do any um, side effects. So it's a pure function. Uh, we talked about um, caching before. If it's pure, you can replace its evaluation with just the value you have already evaluated before, which you take from a cache. So, cool. Um, but that's a bit limited because, um, okay, caching in theory, okay, but where do we put it? We also want a way to query our build, to explore it. We want external tools to know what our build is like, for instance, to import it into an IDE or do anything else. So we need to add something else. In MIL, um, you have basically one thing to do that. It's called a task. It's a type. Uh, and you define a task using a macro, the T macro. Uh, you have actually a couple different subtypes. Here in this example, we just use two. We have sources, which do. Okay, it's a task that is some sources. Uh, if you look into, into the implementation of this, uh, you will see that it calculates if you need to reevaluate the value because your sources have changed. So we'll need to invalidate your cache and so on. And you have, um, with just T, we have a regular target, which is the simplest ta uh, type, the most common type of task in MIL. Um, this will be the, the result of the, this target will be cached by default. And in each target, for instance, if you look at the second line, the bytecode, um, we have a target that calls the one defined on the line above, sources. We do that by just applying sources, sources parentheses, that's just the apply method in Scala. We can do that inside another task only. There is a macro that actually implements that, so it's not going to compile otherwise. And um, basically, the macro will generate all the code so that uh, there is the, um, your value will be put into cache and this will not be re-evaluated every time if uh, your dependencies have not changed and so on. You, I'm not going to go into the implementation detail of MIL. For a user of MIL, you just have to know that it works. And there are different types of tasks, so you just check the documentation to know which one to use. There's the type of tasks that always you evaluate, you don't get a cache, sometimes it's useful, and so on. Um, a few more nice things about MIL, while we're at it. Um, we need some kind of modularity and scoping system because we can have a multi-module build. Uh, this is all done with just plain Scala code. So a module in MIL is just an object that implements a proper trait. Um, we have some tasks that we can apply in this module. Those are just members of the object, which are of the correct type task. Um, so that's it. There is no special DSL, basically. Um, the outputs are cached and queryable as JSON, because we need, uh, we need to serialize the output to some format for our cache. JSON was chosen because it's super common as a format, so if you want to integrate MIL with external tools, I think everybody knows how to pass JSON in like any language, so pretty easy. Um, and there is another point that we need to touch on. Okay, about my compile method before, I said, okay, can, that can just be a pure function, cool. Uh, in the real life, not so much, because uh, Scala compiler, for instance, it takes some uh, source files and it outputs some class files on the file system. Accessing the file system, that's a side effect in uh, functional programming. So we basically have to cheat a little bit. We'll have a behavior that is similar in concept within the confines of what we do in MIL to a pure function, but uh, it, it's not a pure function in the sense of functional programming. Um, basically, the way you do that is just that each task in a given module gets its own dedicated directory where it can write files and no other task will ever write or overwrite file there. And 
your task can just return something that contains a hash code of the content you've just written, your directory or your files, just for cache invalidation purposes, and uh, also, of course, the path to the directory or the files, whatever. And another task down the line can read those files, but it should never write or overwrite there, because that will break a bunch of assumptions. If you need to do, um, if you ever need to write or modify files outside of this directory in a task, uh, you're doing something kind of special. Now, you, you need to know that if you're going to write your own task in mail. Uh, oh, bonus point too. The mail command has pretty little fixed overhead. The first time you launch mail, uh, it will need to compile your build definition. That takes a bit uh, a while. The second time, it launches in like one or two seconds. That's a bit of a progress compared to SVT. Uh, that works with a background diamond, actually. So, as I said, um, the meat of this talk is what? A demo. Um, what are we going to do? We're going to write a Kausei implementation in Scala, of course, and we're going to use Mill as a build tool because that's our subject. Uh, if you've never used Kausei, it's just a little command line tool. Uh, you give it uh, some text and it outputs Something like that. You can choose which ASCII art to choose. By default, it's a cow, that's why it's called cowsay. Uh, the original implementation is in uh, Perl, and uh, this is just a re-implementation. I didn't invent anything. Um, the idea here is to have a multi-module build, or it's a bit too simple. Uh, then we can add cross-compilation for different Scala version, cross-compilation for Scala JS and Scala J JVM, maybe even publish the library at the end if we're quick enough. You have the link to the GitHub repository. Um, for timing reasons, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Here you have all the steps of the demo. I'm going to command them and play with them and all that, but I'm not going to write all the code because that would take too long, too long sorry. So, here we go. At the beginning, we have this. Um, just quickly, we have a git ignore with a directory out. Uh, this is a working directory for mail. In your um, folder, it creates an art directory with where it will write everything, so just a working directory. Uh, mail version, we can specify the version. The mail launch script will automatically download the correct version, just like for SBT. And finally, build.sc, this is our build definition. Um, for those who, have fa who are familiar with the uh, Ammonit REPL, uh, this is the same thing. This actually uses Ammonite. Um, so this is just an Ammonite script. Uh, right now, I only have some imports. Nothing really useful. And my project isn't set up in uh, IntelliJ. So I'm going to have to close my project in IntelliJ and just execute a command, which is, yeah, not really nice. Um, two things about this. First of all, I have not yet defined any module in my build, right? We're just import, it's empty. So this is an external module. That means I can use, uh, because it's external to my build, I can use it to inspect my build and do things like that. So this is going to inspect my build and generate an IntelliJ configuration. Second thing, uh, this is a bit of an old school way to work with IntelliJ. Uh, this should improve in the future from what I've heard. So we launch it. Um, it's really quick because I already executed before, otherwise it would take like uh, 10 seconds just to compile the, the build definition. And if I go back to NTJ, open it again, cool. Um, I also need to just tell NTJ which JDK to use, okay. Now, we have an empty build file, so that's a little bit boring. So, sorry about that, just reordering my windows. Next step. Here we go. This is basically the hello world of mail. It's super simple. We have just a single module here. It's called Corsair, and as I said, it's just a Scala object. Nothing special. To define a module, 
you can just extend module like this. But this is like the most basic type of module in MIL. It doesn't provide a lot of functionality. We want to compile Scala code, so by default, we can extend Scala module with a bunch of default functionality for Scala, of course. Um, this is uh, just an object, so for instance, if I have to define some settings for this thing, pretty easy. Uh, there are just some uh, abstract methods in it that I have to implement. For instance, the Scala version in this case. Uh, same thing for any of the other configuration key, and as I said, those are of this type, target of string, for instance, and target is a type of task. As I said, it's the most common one. Finally, little detail here. In my uh, Scala version target, I just want to give uh, a constant value, so I don't have to uh, use the macro to define it. There is an implicit conversion, but if I want to do anything more complicated than that, I need to manually specify the T macro to define my target. Um, okay, we have a basic module. We can put some code in there. We probably also want to define some tests. Um, there is no magic way to have different configuration for your test and your regular code in the same module that doesn't exist in MIL because you only have modules and tasks and that's it. So how do, do you define your test code? Well, you just create another module and module can be nested into other, inside other modules so we have a test module nested inside our core module. And why do we ex what do we extend? Well, this is actually just an inner trait of Scala module because it's supposed to be used that way. So that makes sense. Um, and again, we have some things to specify, like which test frameworks you're going to use. And of course, we have to specify your dependencies this is, this is a different um, uh, syntax from SBT, but it's basically equivalent. You have a double colon instead of double um, percentage. So, not very different. Um, we can check that this actually works, okay. So, let's execute some command on our module. Our module is called Cosa, and we have the server command on it. For instance, there is a run command, and it's going to run a main class in, in my code. All right. Uh, those warnings are from uh, Zinc, which is the incremental Scala compiler. But if this is what interests us. The cos the cos run command was run, and it printed the hello world. If we go back to the code, well, this is the cos folder that corresponds to our cos module. There is a source folder in it. This is a cos package, and there is uh, a main. You'll note that IntelliJ doesn't recognize this as, this as a module. That's because, yeah, at this moment for IntelliJ, I, just, I have to regenerate the definition each time. That's how it works. For now. Yeah, better. All right. Um, I said something about our build definition being uh, easy to query and inspect. Let's try that. So, MIL provides um, several uh, commands to inspect the build. Uh, the simplest one is resolve. I can do this, resolve, and then underscore is a wildcard. So this is everything that I have access to at basically the root of my module. And I can find the cos module. It's right there. I can keep going like that. Mill resolve cos dot underscore. Again, a wildcard. I will find uh, the test module because it's nested inside the other one. And I can find things like run, which I executed just before, or I can find, say, sources. There are a couple of other useful commands. Um, most common one is show. I can inspect the content of my, uh, well, the result of whatever I want to evaluate. 
for instance, Cosay dot sources. As I said, this is JSON. This is a JSON array in this case. And well, this returns the, direct, the, um, uh, the path to the uh, source directory. So slash cosa slash src. That's the source directory that, that we saw in, uh, in IntelliJ just before. So yeah, that works. Makes sense. And yeah, there is this in the, all this is printed because I, as I said, there is a hash code calculated. So this value, we, so that this value changes if I uh, modify my sources or add a new source file or whatever. All right. Uh, we haven't implemented our cause yet, so let's go to the next step. All right. So, what did we add? We still have the same build here. While we're at it, we added the test. So, cause I, I have a test module inst nested inside it, so I have a test directory nested inside the Cosay directory, and it's the same structure as always. Nothing special there. And I have a test which is, uh, it, it, this is just a Scala test. So, nothing uh, mil specific there. Um, I can, I have a resources folder. Again, if I inspect my build, I will find a resources task that returns this folder and so on. Uh, in my course, I, this is a list of uh, the various core files which I have here. That's just so I can have different pictures in my uh, course. A. And uh, here, I just load them from whose file in the resources. And um, of course, there is a main which takes two arguments. One is in, uh, the name of the core file I want to use, and the other one is the text. So let's just try that this works. Now, one thing. Uh, this run command defined on the Corsi module takes some arguments, that makes sense. And the way you pass arguments here is like uh, most interpreters, like the um, Java command or the Python command or whatever. You first have mil. You can add some arguments here. Let's say this one, watch. Useful. This is uh, the, um, uh, automatically reevaluate the command when uh, the, the sources change. That can be useful. Then, the name of the command you actually want to execute, cosa.run, and then the argument for that command. So that's pretty standard. Default and let's say hello, Scala.io 2019. I think that's the correct job. So, okay, that works. Uh, nothing too impressive so far, I think. Let's do a bit more. So, what changed now? Well, now I have a multi-module build. Real, for real this time, I have two modules. I just have um, the same old course, a, which is not just a library, there is no longer um, main in this. And I have a separate module for a um, command line application which uses the library. Of course, my uh, command line app depends on the other module, so I can just override module depth and give it the other module I depend on. That makes sense. Um, Side note about that. Remember, I define my test module as an inner module inside Kaose. Um How does that work exactly? Well, there is no magic in there. Uh, if I go look at this class that I extend in tests, uh, it uh, actually overrides module depths and it adds the outer class, the Scala module here, which is extended here. So I have a test module that depends on the Corsair module. That's how I can actually test my code. Um, but I'm going to say there is no magic there. Of course, there is never any magic if you know where is the code that implements the behavior. But what I wanted to show here is that you can actually go in, into the code and very easily find how it works. And that's, I think, a 
really huge difference with SBT, especially for our build tool, which is not something that we expect only some developers to use. We expect everyone to use the build tool. So being able to easily uh, go into it, go into your build definition and find how it works with the build tool, I think it's pretty cool. All right, and of course, we can show that uh, it still works. Just now, I have a module, a different module name here. Cool. Um, another thing I can do is I can use uh, wildcards for the commands I execute. I already showed it when I was inspecting my build, but it also works for whatever I want to execute, actually. So, for instance, I can write this. This will call anything.compile, basically, and it, it, it will just match anything that matches that name. So, basically, any module as a root of my build which a with a compile command on it. Um, so, in this case, this will compile both this module and this one. It also works for nested module. That will be the cosa.test module. And finally, there is a, the ultimate wildcard in mail, just uh, two underscores, and that matches any module anywhere, even if you have nested modules, that's all. Uh, so this will compile any module which has a compile command. All right, let's get going. Now, what changed? Well, as I said, uh, the build definition is just regular Scala code, right? So, how do you go about sharing settings between different modules, uh, re reusing settings, whatever? Uh, the same way you would in any piece of Scala code, you can use composition or inheritance, same way. Uh, one thing, uh, this is actually provided by the Ammonit REPL, which is used to interpret those uh, SC files. Um, I can refer to another script file with file dot the name of the file. So I have a settings file right here with just my Scala version, why not? And, I can use, and this basically imports an object with the content of that file, so I can use it here, like that. Um, and of course, I can just define a trait here, and both of my modules inherit from the same trait. Nothing special there, I hope. Um, the reason I show that is because in SBT, you could do something like, say, um, Scala version in this build, for instance, and then you, you give it a value, whatever. Uh, in mill, you don't have any kind of magic thing like that, which will need to be interpreted to build the actual model. The model is right there in your build definition. So it can be a bit more verbose in some cases. That's notable. Um, is it a bad thing? I would say no, because it's simply easier to find where a setting uh, value comes from. If I have my module called say, and I want to know where the Scala version comes from, well, either it's defined here or it's inherited. That's all. I can find it. Um, sorry. So. This is all well and good, but a bit simple. So what about cross-compilation? Uh, I have a library now. Maybe I want to cross-compile my library for Scala 2.12 and Scala 2.13. Um, maybe even Doty, but sorry, I didn't do that. Uh, well, again, I, can't, I cannot have one module with different version of the settings in it or anything like that. That does not exist in MIL. So there is only one way. I have to have different modules. I have to have two modules, one for my Kaosei Scala 2.12 and one for my Kaosei Scala 2.13. That's it. Uh, um, MIL does provide a 
some help to make this easier with this class, cross, which will create different instances of a same module with a different parameter. So my object has become a class because I will need to instantiate different versions with a parameter which is a Scala version because I have two different Scala versions. I extend cross Scala module, this provides, this will basically use this parameter to define the Scala version. And I use, I still have my class A object, but now it extends cross. I have to give it two parameters, a type parameter, which class do I want to use to instantiate my modules, and basically the list of parameters that will be given to this class. So this is Scala 2.12 and this is Scala 2.13. And uh, how, does this, how, does, uh, how does this work? Well, let's see. If I type, again, I want to see what exists in my build now. This, I do have two different modules now with different names. And I can choose to just execute one, for instance, this one. And I need to quote this, this is uh, not specific to me, this is for the, the shell. So it knows this is a single parameter. And, uh, oops, sorry. That's not what I wanted. Here you go. Okay, this still works. Um, of course, wildcards still work the same. I, had, I have two modules which will match uh, this pattern. So we'll execute both. Now, wait a minute. There was a little bit of magic there, actually. I typed cause a, okay, this is wildcard, we don't care about it, dot test. This is not a command or task, this is the name of a module, remember? There is a test module defined inside the cause a module. Why didn't I name which command to execute? Um, well, again, we can just look into that. So, test, this extends test, let's have a look. Um, okay, I inherit from something else, let's have a look there. There's again a bit of inheritance, and I find this, override default command name. So, just a little tip, if you want to have a default command on a module, for instance on your, on your test module, most of the time you will just execute the test command, nothing else, right? So you can just define a default command like this you have to inherit the trait task module, which has this as a, an abstract method that you have to define. Okay, so this is cross compilation for two different versions of Scala. Um, but that's still a little bit easy, I think. So let's go straight there. Ah, what did I do? Probably not what I wanted. This is not paid advertisement for Git Kraken. All right, so this is getting a bit more complicated. That's because I still need to define different modules. I want to compile for the JVM with Scala 2.12, Scala 2.13, for Scala JS, Scala 2.12, Scala 2.13. That's four different modules. For the simple cross compilation, MIL has a very uh, relatively simple way to do it. For Scala.js, Scala.jvm, it's a bit more complicated, but I can just do it by hand. Uh, in principle, we could probably automate quite a lot of this, but at the moment, we do have to do it manually. So what do we do? Well, I still have a cos a object right here. Now it just extends the module, that's a simple module with nothing special. 
This will be useful just for scoping because I will define some uh, nested module inside it, that's all. I will uh, define two modules in there, a JVM and a JS1, and both of them use the same technique we saw before for cross compilation, just for the Scala version. This still extends this uh, cross. Um, and of course, there's a lot of similarity between my uh, both builds. So again, I use a uh, standard Scala technique. This one extends Corsair module. This one also extends Corsair module. My trade Corsair module is defined here. And we still find the same old things as before, my dependencies and all that. There are a couple new things that I introduced. Mill source path. This one is pretty useful to know because this is actually the path to the root of my module. Um, everything that I want to use in my module will sit in a folder with the same name as my module, usually. But I can redefine it if I want. This is useful if I want to define a bunch of different modules, but I want to put all my source code in a single folder, which is what happens here. Most of my, so most of my source code is the same for Scala.js and Scala.jvm. So I just want to keep a single folder, Kaosai. Um, for my JS and my JVM modules. I can just redefine it like this. My Cursei module is already in the right place, right here. For my uh, Cursei.jvm and Cursei.js module, I can just redefine mill source path to be the same. Um, I st may still want to have some different code for JavaScript and for Scala.js. So what do I do? Well, I already showed you how we can inspect the, um, our source, uh, the sources ta a target, which uh, returns the SRC folder. But of course, if I want to redefine it, I can basically just look at the default implementation, copy paste, rewrite it, however I want. So I still have a SRC um, folder, and I add another one, and I define something called platform segment, but just so I can have one folder for Scala.js specific code, and another one for code which is specific for Scala and the JVM. And it works. I have two different implementations for this class here. Um, what else is interesting here? Well, we do need to um, resolve different versions of our dependencies. Uh, in SBT, you use like a triple uh, percentage symbols in uh, the definition of your uh, dependency. In mill is just a different syntax. You still keep uh, double columns here. That's because it's a Scala dependency, so if there's a Scala version in it. And you do the same thing here, uh, because you will also get the Scala.js version in the name of the library for the Scala.js version. That's it. By the way, I read up, so this is just a Scala method. I can check the documentation. And the Scala doc in this case does uh, say exactly what I just told you. Uh, except not for Scala.js, actually. So if you want to improve the documentation, I think pull requests are probably welcome. OK, so this should work. We can uh, import it again into IntelliJ. And yes, this is the sort of command that you end up just putting in your shell in its script with uh, an alias, because it's horrible to type every time. Um, this is a tip just for people who, who use uh, IntelliJ. You can do um, load and load modules. You can see here that I, I do have different modules in IntelliJ, that's the same modules that I have in my mail build. I can unload some of them and just keep, for instance, I can uh, keep only the JS213 module just to look at what happens when I'm using Scala.js with Scala213. All right. Um, does this work? That's a good question. Well, I now have a module with this name. Cosset.js, it's a course module, so I can give it a parameter here with the Scala version, and I can call the test module that's defined inside it, and there is still a default test command on my test module. All right. Uh, 
and this should work. Okay, so my test still works, and here we see some uh, output from the Scala.js compiler plugin. So that looks good. Now, what else can we do? Well, there is something that changed compared to the pre previous version of my code. I actually no longer use those resource files. Why? Because for Scala.js, that doesn't work. Scala.js, you don't have like uh, some resources in your jar. You don't have a jar, you have a JavaScript file. Um, so what did I do? Well, I still have this uh, enumeration that lists the content of those files, but now I just hard-coded everything into this file. But I don't really like it. I think if someone wants to submit a new nice car file to my library, like this one, it should be pretty easy. They shouldn't need to write some Scala code. So there is a solution. I can keep this file, but I can generate this Scala code um, at compile time, right? So let's do some uh, code generation. This is the next step. Okay, my class has disappeared because now it's going to be generated actually. And if I look at my uh, build definition, everything happens here. And what did I do? Okay, so I have this, curl files. I'm created a um, task of type sources with a folder called curl files. It's, it sits right here. I have the same old files in it. Still works. Sources, this is what you use to list source files. That's pretty self-explanatory, I think. Of course, if I modify any of the files in this directory and I reevaluate uh, core files, it will return a different uh, result, which will um, trigger reevaluation for all of our tasks down the line, which depends on those values. So that's how MIL can uh, uh, cache values by default. All core files, this is just a target, regular target. So I can write some Scala code inside this, return some value, and my target will just cache the return value by default, and that's basically what it does. So uh, here I list the files, and uh, I only take them with the right, ex uh, the files with the correct extensions, things like that. This is just regular Scala code. There is one thing to note, this. Uh, this is a file system manipulation library written by Liaoyi. He also he wrote mail, so he uses this library inside. Makes sense. Um, it's actually pretty nice to use walk, I just walking a directory to list all the files inside it, recursively. What does this return? This return a target of a sequence, because I can have several files, of pathrefs. Pathref, this is um, the magic for uh, the concept I explained right at the beginning um, about files which are generated by my task. This is what I return. If I look at this, there is some code here. Basically what it does, I give it a path, and it returns an object that contains the same path and also a um, hash code of the content of the directory. So this value will change if my files have changed. Again, that's really important for cache validation. And then generated sources and our targets. I'm calling code, defining another file, codegen.fsc here, that I have imported, as I already showed you. I generate some file. Where do I generate them? Here. Um, my generated sources uh, task is allowed to write files to its own special working directory. I can use t.context to get some context about the current task. I can only call that inside the t macro, and that is just the path to the folder that I'm allowed to use. So I write my files here to that folder, and I return the reference to the directory. Um, does this work? Well, it should work. I can still, uh, oops, 
I can still execute my test, for instance. And I can still execute something like this. Um, interesting thing here about, um, I did some code generation, okay, I'm happy about that. Um, this is pretty simple to write. And this is, I think, the big advantage of Mill over some other build tools. It's just simply pretty easy to write your own custom build code if you don't find someone who, already wrote a or, um, who did already write a plugin that does what you want. And that's basically the whole point of this thing. So, we're not going to go um, into the final step, which was publishing the libraries. Sorry about that, because we're a bit short on time. Uh, but it's pretty easy. This is just straight from the mill documentation. Uh, you can find the um, um, repo uh, at this uh, URL right here. Um, I also added some resources to some useful resources to the slides. I will publish the slides so you can check out all of this. This is a link to the official Mill documentation, some uh, blog post by Yaoi about the design of Mill. So there's a GitHub channel if you have questions about Mill. That's probably the right place to go. A really nice example using Mill to build uh, build pipelines. Um, I said something little hint about improvement in IntelliJ support that comes right from these blog posts, and some code from myself using Mill because I have a fuller version of this uh, course example. There is also a Slack bot in there, so if someone is interested. So that's all for today. So thanks for your attention. And I don't know if you have uh, time for questions. Okay, we have two minutes for questions, really quick. There's someone right there. What about uh, transitive dependency uh, overrides or eviction? Okay, so basically uh, what Mill does for um, dependency resolution, it just uses uh, Corsier, which also became the default for SBT in uh, SBT 1.3, by the way. So um, you can do everything you can do with Corsier. Um, I didn't show how this is done in terms of syntax, but that's it. That's basically the answer. One last question. Any other question? Well, I think not. So thanks a lot for, for your attention. <laughs>